um, in hearing from me. I'm going to talk for hopefully about sort of um, 35, 40 minutes, and I want to have a good amount of time at the end for questions. Please feel free to grill me. You can disagree with what I, I have to say. I'd, I'd love to learn different viewpoints on this. So what I'm going to talk about today is the topic of responsible business, but in particular, three aspects of it. So what is it? And you might think, well, isn't that obvious? We know what a responsible business is, but I'm actually going to provide a different perspective than you might typically hear. Does it work? And also how to evaluate it, because Hamid was mentioning uh, what you might be looking at in the exam in terms of trying to value companies and make this something which is concrete rather than just a nice idea. So I'm going to go through each of them in turn. Hopefully I'll spend most of my time on the third part. But in order to tell you, well, what is it? I'm going to give you an example and I want to take you on a little bit of a journey because uh, we might be locked down again in, in, in the UK and in France. So let me at least take you on a metaphorical journey around the world. So I want to take you to uh, the Great Rift Valley. So this stretches across two continents and 6,000 kilometers from Lebanon in Asia to Mozambique in Africa. And it has some of the world's highest mountains but it also has some of the world's deepest lakes. And one of these lakes is a lake called Lake Magadi, and that's on the Kenyan stretch of the Great Rift Valley. Now you might think, well, it's hard for me to imagine that I'm here because you've never seen it before, but you may have seen it before. You may have seen it not on the small screen of your laptop, but on the big screen of a movie theater in the movie, The Constant Gardener, based on the John Le Carré novel of the same name. Now, indeed, millions of people around the world have seen this lake because they've seen the movie, but fewer than a thousand people call the lake their home. And one of these people is a gentleman called Emmanuel Saronga, and he makes his living selling goats. Now, for Emmanuel, it used to be that cash was king. So when he sold a goat, he would get cash, and then he would have to check that cash in case it was forged. He'd have to store that cash and worry about being robbed. And then if he wanted to bank that cash, he would have to take it to the nearest bank. But that was not just the case of going down to the Promenade des Anglais and just banking it there. You'd have to walk for an entire day to get to the bank. So his life was really tough, right? So he couldn't graze his goats in the greenest pastures. He had to be within one day of a bank. But his life completely changed in 2007, and that was because of a responsible business. And that responsible business was Vodafone. And Vodafone launched M-Pesa, which is a mobile money service in Kenya. So what is mobile money? So we often think it's mobile banking. Right? I have a bank account with, uh, with, with Barclays, and I can operate it on my phone rather than going down to the high street. But that's not the case, right? For mobile money, you don't even need to have a bank account to begin with. And that's really important because many people in Kenya didn't have access to the banking system. And so this has transformed Emmanuel's life. Right? He no longer needs to deal with cash. He no longer needs to worry about robbery or forgery. He can grace his goats wherever he wants to. And on his phone, he has a record of every transaction, so his accounting is easy. And I don't want to make one thing out of just one story, but there was a study by professors at MIT showing that within the first seven years of M-Pesa, 200,000 households got lifted out of poverty. And many of these households were headed up by women. It allowed them to move from, business, from agriculture to business and retail. So that's one story that I have on Vodafone. But let me now tell you a, a different story. And that different story is about tax. So in 2012, Vodafone became the first telecoms company around the world to release a tax transparency report showing how much tax they were paying to governments worldwide. And that's really important because in telecoms, you could choose to locate your licenses in low tax countries. So I've got two questions for everybody on this webinar to think about. Which of these decisions created most value for society? And which of these decisions 
if it had not been taken, would have led to the most public outrage or worse than Vodafone's corporate social responsibility, rating or reputation. Now, I'm not going to poll all of you on this um, webinar because I'm pretty sure that most of you would agree with the answer. So which decision created most value for society? It was the first one, right? By launching Mpesa, they lifted 200,000 households out of poverty. But what about the second question? What would have been the outrage if Vodafone had not launched Mpesa? It would have been nothing. But you don't get in trouble with the media for not launching an idea. You don't suffer boycotts from customers for not doing an invention. Why? Because customers and the media, they would have never thought that it was even possible to do this crazy idea of launching the idea of banking without a bank. But what happens if you are not transparent on taxes, you can suffer boycotts. And indeed, this is something that Vodafone itself suffered a couple of years ago. So what is the point of my opening story? Right. So the question was, what is responsible investing? Now, typically, we think about responsible investing as avoiding companies that do harm. We typically think about it as the answer to the second question. We don't want to invest in a company that cheats on taxes, that mistreats its workers, that pollutes the environment. But I want to say that that is not enough. But we typically think about responsible business as doing no harm. But instead, I want to shift our thinking on responsible business and think about actively doing good. Right. So the point of responsibility is not just risk management. It's not just to avoid negative outcomes, but it's to do positive outcomes such as innovation or excellence, launching these great ideas like m -Pesa. But that is something which is typically ignored in a lot of the CSR or ESG ratings or measures, which I'm going to come back to in the third part of this talk. And so this goes to a, a framework that I'll use a few times, which is I, I see the value that a company creates as being given by a pie. And you can think that the company can either divide that pie and give it to investors in the form of profits, or give it to society in the form of taxes to the government or wages to the workers or low prices to customers. And we often think that responsibility is about splitting the pie differently. So we're moving from here to here. So a company pays more wages or gives loads of money to Black Lives Matter, that's really good for its image, it's said to be fair. But why I want to change your thinking is I want to say that responsibility can't just be about splitting the pie like this. For two reasons. So number one, if responsibility is about making the company less profitable, then managers just won't want to do it. And indeed, you saw last year, 181 chief executives sign the business roundtable statement saying they would care about society, but many, they just didn't put it into practice. And so this is why, and why would they, right? Because if responsibility makes a company less profitable, then you don't want to genuinely implement it. You will just do greenwashing. You'll just claim to be responsible. The second reason why responsibility can't just be about splitting the pie differently is that it's bad for investors. Now, many people might think, I don't care, right? Investors are often portrayed as nameless, faceless capitalists, right? They are them. Society is us. If we can take from them and give to us, then that's good. But what I want to stress is that investors are not them. They are us. They include parents saving for their children's education. They include pension funds saving for retirees. They include an insurance company funding future claims. So any repurposing of business absolutely needs to take investors seriously. So this is why my view of responsibility is that it's about growing the pie. Right? We do want to increase the orange, but the way we do that is not by giving them a greater slice of what there is already by giving charitable donations, but by being creative, being ruthlessly committed to innovation and excellence, designing some things like M-Pesa, 
which try to solve social problems like financial inclusion. And the beauty of this is that, well, even though M-Pesa was launched to solve a social problem, ultimately Vodafone benefited because Vodafone was able to monetize it. So the whole idea of pie growing is that you first think about how can I serve society? And then later on, you might be able to benefit from this. So my definition of a responsible business is the following. It is one that seeks to create profits only through creating value for society. So let me just take a minute to pick apart this definition, because the final four words should not be novel to you. So everybody knew you didn't need to me to come on in this webinar and tell you that responsibility is about creating value for society. But where, where I want to shift your thinking is the first part. It's about creating profits through creating value for society. So profits are not a bad thing, right? Like profits are a byproduct of doing a great job and creating value for society. So this is, where, so this is something where a company has a responsibility to its shareholders. But the word only is really important. Right, because you could create profits by price gouging your customers or mistreating your workers. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to view profits as a byproduct of serving society and not the end goal. Now, at this point, you might think, well, everything Alex says, that sounds great, but it's just too good to be true. Where is the evidence, right? I've said you should run a company thinking I want to serve society and then magically some profits will appear. But isn't this a bit wishful thinking? So what Hamid and I do actually most of the time is, is actually, as you're saying, not just teaching, but doing academic research. And one of the things I wanted to look at when I started 15 years ago in this profession was to look at are responsible companies ones that will actually do better in the long term? Or are they just fluffy companies who are distracted from the bottom line? Now, the big question is, well, if you want to do that, how do you measure how responsible a company is? That's really tricky. You can't just look at the mission statement, because as I mentioned, there were companies that sound, signed the business roundtable statement and never put it into practice. So what I decided to look at was how well a company treats its employees. Now, you might think, well, why do I focus on employees, not the environment or customers or tax? Well, I focus on employees because I had a very good measure available, which was the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America. So this measures the list of how well a company treats its workers. There's a similar list in France and throughout the world. But why I thought this list was really good was for two reasons. The first is that it was available from 1984. So I had tons of data, right? And that's very important. Why? Because responsibility, it's a pretty new phenomenon. So some data sources have only been around since, let's say, 2010. And I showed you that responsibility paid off between 2010 and 2019. You might think, well, maybe it only pays off in an upswing. Maybe right now we're in a pandemic, we don't care about it, it's just a luxury. So because I looked at data from 1984, this included things such as the collapse of the internet bubble in 2000, 2001. It included the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. So I could make sure that this covers different time periods, including the difficult time periods. The second reason, why this was important was that the data was very thorough. So how did it measure whether a company was treating its work as well? So it did look at pay, but notice pay is only one part of it. You could pay your work as well, but not give them meaningful work and a good corporate culture and a work-life balance. So this surveyed the employees and tried to take all of those factors into account. And then what right, we know, um, and as Howard was mentioning, Correlation doesn't imply causation. Is it that employee satisfaction causes better financial performance? Or is it the opposite? Only once a company is performing well financially can it start to invest in employee satisfaction. 
So I do a lot of methodology to address that. I'm not going to bore you with all of the academic methodology. I'm happy to answer it in questions if people are interested. But instead, I want to get to the bottom line for practitioners, which is all of you. So what I found was that the 100 best companies to work for in America beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28-year period. So that's 89 to 184% cumulative. And it's worth pausing here to highlight the significance of this result, because you might think, well, isn't that obvious that companies that treat their workers better will do better? But it's not obvious because treating your work as well is costly. Right? It costs money to pay them better, to train them, to give them paternity and maternity leave. And often many companies, they think this is a waste of money. That's why we have things such as sweatshops and mistreatment of workers. People think it's at the expense of profit. But what this shows is this fundamentally changes the way that we should think about companies, and this is going to come relevant for the assignment that you're going to do at the end of class, but when you value companies, it's not just sufficient to think about things such as profits and dividends and balance sheet, but to think about is a company serving society, because if it does, it might ultimately benefit shareholders in the long term. Why? Because if employees are motivated and productive, then they're going to go above and beyond in terms of the value they deliver back to companies. Right. So you often hear about employee satisfaction and these other things as being non-financial factors. But what the research suggests is that these are financial factors. Right. So they will affect the company's performance financially. I'm more sure you soon have heard of the UN principles for responsible investment. And it says that responsible investment is about taking these non-financial factors into account. But I don't even know why they need the word responsible. This should just be called the principles of investment. Right? Investment involves taking into account any factor that is financially material, such as this. And so that takes me to the final part, which is how to evaluate it, where I want to spend most of my time, right? Because that is the tricky thing. What I've said to you so far, to sum up, number one is that responsibility, change our thinking. It's not just about doing no harm. It's about actively doing good. The second part was saying, well, actively doing good, that's not just worthy and fluffy. It shines through into the bottom line. So we care about it, even if as an investor, our only goal is to make money. But the third part is how to evaluate it. And this is really difficult. And actually, out of all of the practitioners that I speak to, I spend far more time talking to investors than I do to companies. So hopefully a lot of this is not just based on my academic research, but learning from best practice by speaking to investors. So I'll try to distill this into the next sort of 15 minutes before we have Q&A. So this is, some, this is a field which has changed so much over the last 15 years. So previously, how did we evaluate whether a company was responsible? It was through an approach which is exclusionary or screening. So what I mean by that is investor will decide what counts as responsible. You need to tick a certain box. And if you don't tick the box, or if you tick the wrong box, you are out. So if you are in a sin industry, which maybe people said was tobacco or alcohol or gambling, you couldn't be invested in. If you had low board diversity or a high pay ratio, or maybe you treated your workers badly, then you were out. OK, so this screen decided what the admissible universe was. And then out of the admissible universe, you would decide that purely on financial factors. Right, so social performance here was only the foot in the door. And then after you were in, you ignored it and you only considered the financial traditional factors. Okay, so there's a number of problems with, with that approach. So the first approach is it had very blunt measures of social performance. They're very easy to manipulate. For example, you could look at board diversity, and it might be there's a company which doesn't care at all about board diversity, but chooses to put a token minority on the board just to tick a box. So these box ticking measures are pretty easy to manipulate. 
The strategic context, I'm going to come back to that later. That's something I'm going to go into detail. But I think the third and the fourth are ones I particularly want to focus on because that is something which is really related to the first part of the talk. So a lot of these metrics are based on pi splitting rather than pi growing. They're based on the idea that there is a fixed pi and therefore anything that goes to one party is at the expense of another. So pay ratios are one of those things. For example, there's many investors which look at the ratio of CEO pay to worker pay. And they argue, well, if the CEO is being paid a lot, right, that's at the expense of everybody else. So if the CEO wasn't so greedy, then maybe everybody else would be paid more. And one example of that was um, last year. So you would have seen that Bob Iger of Disney, he was in a lot of trouble for being paid much, much more than the average employee. But notice that's based on the fixed pi mentality, the idea that his pay was at the expense of everybody else. In fact, Bob Iger was paid a lot because he created a lot of value, right? The value of Disney had gone up by 578% since he started, compared to 140% for the S&P 500 index. And he'd also created 70,000 jobs. Right, so this high pay wasn't at the expense of everybody else. It was because the company done really well. And if pay is linked to performance, when the company does well, you should be paid a lot. So that's one of the problems with the traditional metric. And the final thing was that a lot of these metrics focus on do no harm rather than actively doing good. Right, so looking at treatment of workers or diversity or pay ratio, that looks at a company not crossing any red lines. But if Vodafone does something like launch m which has a huge effect on society, that is not going to be picked up in any of those four metrics here, which is why I spent a long time at the start highlighting the shift in thinking I'd like you to start thinking about. Okay, and these limitations are serious. Right, as Hamid may have already highlighted, the average ESG fund does not outperform. So a lot of people think about ESG, they highlight this and analyze it, but most of these funds don't actually beat the market. And I think it's because they're using these very unsophisticated measures. Okay, so if that's the case, right, how do we then try to put this into practice? And so one of my other jobs is I serve on the Responsible Investment Advisory Committee for Royal London Asset Management. So we run five sustainable funds. So this is something I had firsthand knowledge of. So what this is, is the idea of integration. So this means that we consider ESG factors alongside financial factors. So it's not that they're just the foot in the door. And once you're in, you consider only financial factors. It's that we consider them alongside financial factors. Now, one question I'm often asked is what weight do we put on the financial factors versus the ESG factors? And I think that's the wrong question, right? Because right at the moment, let's say you're a traditional investor, you still consider more than just the financial factors, you'll consider management quality as well. And there's no way to weight the importance of management quality versus financial factors. You're just going to take both of them into account. Just like when you decide your first job after EDEC, you're going to take into account salary and you're going to take into account the trading opportunities at the company and whether you like the people. You don't weight them. You don't have any sort of formula, but you know to consider them. And that's indeed the case here with ESG. We will consider them alongside financial factors and management factors. And what we do at Royal London is we do what's called a net benefit test. So we're going to ask ourselves, does the company provide a net benefit to society? So the importance of this is it takes a holistic approach. So if indeed a company does badly on some of these dimensions, so maybe it has low board diversity, that can be outweighed by the fact that it's doing loads of good. It could be contributing a lot of jobs. It could be making a product like m which creates a lot of value for society. And also, it considers excellence, right? Not just doing no harm, but actively doing good. This is how much value you're actively creating. 
Now, one question I'm always asked is, again, the waiting question is, well, how do we know? Isn't this just purely subjective, right? So if indeed a company is doing badly to its workers, let's say Amazon, but on the other hand, Amazon is providing a lot of products to customers at low prices, and it's also allowing them to sell the secondhand goods rather than recycle them. How do we know which is out going to balance the other? Isn't this something which is purely subjective? And I would say, yes, it is subjective, but that doesn't mean that we should ignore that we should shy away from this. Right? So when you're hiring a person for your company, one non-subjective way is just to look at their exam grades, right? So there you've got complete objectivity. But as we know, just looking at the exam grades, that'll be really incomplete. That will take into account that will ignore the qualitative dimensions, such as a person's drive and a person's grit, right? And now there's no formula to weight the importance of grit and drive and fit versus academic ability, but you can still take that into account. And that is the same right, for responsible business. So when you do your, your assignments for Hamid, right, yes, you can, will consider this. There's no way to find out how much weight to put quantitatively onto those factors. But these, what I can do here and what I'm teaching here is how do we think about what's important? And one of the big things I'm stressing so far is it's actively do good versus do no harm. What other things can I add to provide more structure? This is the really important point here, which is the point of materiality, which I'm going to go into a lot of detail. And Hamid said that this was something he particularly wanted me to spend some time on. So this goes back to the idea of, well, if you're a responsible business, you need to think about what investments to undertake, but also what investments to turn down. So one of the key reasons why companies fail to think about responsible business in a correct way is they think they have to do everything, right? They need to serve every stakeholder and they need to um, do, take every investment. So they might have, if you think about the third red bullet from the bottom, a purpose statement which says something like this. Our purpose is to serve customers, workers, suppliers, environment, communities and investors. Now that sounds great. It means that you're saving everybody, but that's just not realistic, right? Because you're going to face difficult decisions and those decisions will involve trade-offs. So I wanted to choose a French company here for an example. So Engie, the French energy company, they recently had to choose, do we shut down Hazelwood, which was the most polluting power plant in the OECD? Now, if they shut the plant, it would be good for the environment but be bad for workers because 750 workers would lose their jobs. So if your purpose is to serve everybody, right, then how do you evaluate a decision which is going to be good for employees, or bad for employees, but good for the environment? So what materiality means is it means that out of all the stakeholders that we have, who are the ones that are the most important to us? Who is first among equals? So if you look at things like the business roundtable statement, they avoid the question. Right? They say we're here to serve everybody, but that makes no sense because to focus on a few particular clients, right, you have to ignore some others. So it's fine kind of me to say I spent two and a half years writing my book. And in order to do that, I, I had to stop. I had to reduce my, my research output and the number of papers I'm publishing in top journals. Why? Because there's only a certain number of hours in the day. And so this is the main thing that I think responsible businesses get wrong is they forget that actually we don't have to do everything. We don't need to solve all of the world's problems. We need to focus on a few. So I think for you as investors, right, one of the important things to look at is, is the company greenwashing, trying to tick every single box or does it know its place in the world and the specific social problems it's supposed to serve. And this is the concept of materiality. So what I'm showing you here is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board's materiality map. And what this does is it goes industry by industry and highlights what are the most material stakeholder issues. So if we think about the first column, extractives and minerals processing, the environment really matters because you have a huge effect on it. But what if you're a bank? 
right? Well, the environment isn't so important. What really matters is something like selling practices and product labeling. You don't want to be caught in a Wells Fargo fake bank account scandal. Okay, so what that means is that, yeah, climate change is really important. I, I really care about it myself. But maybe if you're a bank, the main way that you move the needle is that you're very transparent to your customers and you avoid these problems with data privacy and customer um, security and so forth. And that links me to my final academic study here. So what this paper looked at was it looked at the MSCI ESG rating. So I'm going to go to the ESG ratings as one of my final topics. But what they do is there's external rating agencies which will measure a company's responsibility. And they look at companies that do well across the board on every single dimension of customers, employees, and the environment. And they find that the ones that do well across the board, they don't actually beat the market. They only beat the market by one and a half percent per year, which is insignificant. But when they redo it and they look at companies that beat the market on the material issues, but they scale back on the immaterial issues, they do beat the market by 4.8% per year. So let me strip back from the study. What is the key punchline of this is that when evaluating companies don't have a box ticking idea that a company needs to do well on everything, instead think about what are the specific material dimensions for that company, make sure it does well on that. And if it's scaling back on everything, well, that on other things, that's not necessarily bad, it just knows what its priorities are. And so the final thing I'm going to talk about is, is what are the data sources? So I've said we want to look about do no, uh, not just do no harm, but actively do good. We want to look at not just pie splitting, but pie growing. We want to take materiality and excellence into account. But where do we get our data from? OK, so different sources here. So some of them you'll know. One of them is company sustainability report. So within a company, they will try to report on their sustainability metrics. And all I'll encourage you to look at is not just the do no harm stuff, but the actively do good stuff. And also not just quantitative measures like pay and benefits and pay ratios, but if they describe qualitatively what they're doing to ensure, say, a healthy corporate culture, that's something which is much harder to manipulate than just numbers. We have third party data providers. So that's something which is independent because obviously a company can choose what to report. And so there's some providers which look at specific dimensions. So I talked to you about the best company study for employees. There's other measures like the carbon disclosure project for carbon emissions. And there's also general providers which will look at your ratings across many things, so employees and the environment and so on. And those are one big example is the ESG ratings which are given out by various agencies. So MSCI is a rating provider. Sustainalytics, Thomson Reuters, Bloomberg, they are all other providers. And what they do is they analyze company reports and World Bank reports and other things to try to rate a company's sustainability, just like credit ratings, like S&P and Moody's do that for credit worthiness. Now, the big problem is there's a huge amount of discrepancy between the ratings. So if you look at credit worthiness, S&P and Moody's, there'll be a correlation of 0.9. People will agree on what the credit worthiness of company is. But the correlation for um, companies is for, for sustainability is really low. So people just can't agree. And so why is there this disagreement? A few sources. First source is scope, is they don't even agree what is important to measure. So if you look at climate and the environment, everybody will put greenhouse gas emissions into account, but only some of them would consider electromagnetic radiation. Another one of them is even if they agree that's important, how do we measure it? So if you want to measure female friendliness, do you look at the gender pay gap? Do you look at the percentage of women on the board? The percentage of women in the workforce? And finally, for weighting, right, they may put different weights in the different dimensions. And so what I've done is I've actually described, so I, on my book's website, I have a blog where any important paper which came out after I finished the book, I will write about it. And so this will hopefully go into this in more detail. But what is the punchline for all of you? 
So what it means is you can't just take an ESG rating off the shelf. We're going to buy every company where MSCI rates them AAA. Instead, the ratings are still useful, but to read the actual report. So what they say in the report behind it is why they are giving it a certain rating. So it might be that they've measured it in a way that you think is, is, is silly, or maybe they're measuring the wrong characteristics. Maybe their scope is not what you care about. So what matters here is the content of the report, not so much the headline figure. So some people will look at the low correlation and say ESG ratings are completely useless, but that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Instead, it's something where um, you will just need to bear this in mind and read the actual report and think about, well, what is it that goes into the rating? So one simple analogy I'll often use is when you choose food, you can look at the overall calories, but that doesn't tell you much. What you want to look at how much of the calories are from protein versus fat versus carbohydrate, and that's, that disaggregated number is much better than the um, overall number. Final point before I get to, to questions is the final approach, which I think is the really useful one, is to simply talk to management and ask them specific questions. And this might seem awfully unsophisticated, but right? you might want to say, you might think as a finance professor, I should tell you to run some data, but this is where a lot of the key investors spend their time speaking to management and asking them questions. Now, I know that you can't do that for your assignment, but many of you might want to become investors in the future. And even when you to read the data sources like the annual report, think about whether they answer these questions. And so what I've done is I've come up with a list of 10 questions after speaking to investors about this for so many years. And so I'm not going to go through all of them, but a few of them might be useful. So the first is what is your enterprise's purpose? What have you come up? Why have you come up with this? And importantly, what have you omitted from your purpose? Right, so purpose is just as much about knowing what not to do as what to do. So a company whose purpose statement covers everything, that's not that useful. But if there's ones which will highlight what they chose not to do, that's valuable. I also have some questions on excellence and innovation. I've highlighted the importance of excellence. You might think, well, shouldn't every company choose to be excellent? But um, here, a purposeful company will be excellent in areas even if they are not linked to shareholder value. Just like Hamid kindly said, right? So a purposeful professor will try to devote a lot of attention to teaching, even though teaching does not enter tenure or academic ranking or status. And finally, in terms of share stakeholders, so there's one leading investor in the UK who asked the first question here. What are the strengths and relationship weaknesses in your relationships with your people? And what are your plans for improvement? And she tells me that some CEOs will answer that and others will tell her, I didn't know you were going to ask me about my people. And the next time I'm going to bring along my HR director. Well, and this tells you who are the CEOs who care about their workers and who are the ones who just view them as being delegatable to HR. So I'm shortly going to open it to questions, but as Hamid says, um, what I spent two and a half years doing is to write a book about this. And like the royalties you get for writing a book are really, really tiny. But what I wanted to write about this is to show how responsible business is something which is realistic. So often people think that responsible business is fluffy and worthy and tree huggy. I wanted to write about this as a finance professor. Finance professors normally have no emotions and, and, and no sentiment, but I wanted to show that these are things which is commercially important and to provide a framework to put it into practice. And I wanted to base it not on wishful thinking, but a lot of academic evidence. But unfortunately, academic papers are written in a very dense way. So I wanted to make this accessible for a general audience. And so that's what I came up with. And, and as I mentioned, there's certain things that happened after the book was finished, like the coronavirus crisis. So I kept a blog up here, which is freely available. Anybody can see it, regardless of whether you bought the book. And so that will just provide some hopefully useful updates for anybody interested in this. Thank you so much, Hamid, again, for the, the really great opportunity. Uh, let me go back to you for questions. If you've got questions, feel free to put that on the Q&A. Uh, also, if you rather will ask the question in person, then just say so on the Q&A on the chat, and then we will unmute you, and, and we'd love to hear that, that the questions. So thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thanks a lot for this great uh, talk. So uh, I am not sure if people, students, you guys can 
can I guess mute and unmute yourself and talk or you can chat uh, if you have a question. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Just please know, let us know if you cannot. Uh, I believe you should be able to chat. Yes, yeah, so I think you can, if you've got a question. Oh yeah, so I see one in the Q&A um, right, right now. So, ah, you oh, sorry, cannot unmute yourself, yeah. okay. Yeah. So if you if you chat and you want to, you can just write and I unmute you, you if you want to talk. Otherwise you can just post your, your questions here. Uh, while you are uh, you are writing, I, I have a question. <laughs> I have some questions for Alex. So Alex, we you know think about a discounted cash flow valuation. So our our value comes either from the cash flows on the top or the sort of the discount rate. So how should we think about uh, the effect of the social responsibility? Is it that so you were saying that increases profit? So it seems that the cash flows is going to change. But do we know? What do we know about the, the, the cost of capital? So can you say some stuff about that? that would be great. Thanks, Hamid. So I think what the main mechanism through which it affects valuation is through the cash flow. So one other thing that I didn't mention about my employee satisfaction study is I looked at what happened in the future in terms of these companies' profits. And what I found was that every three months, because companies report their quarterly earnings in the US, was that these companies were delivering more profits than what equity analysts like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were predicting. Why? Because the employees were productive and motivated, but the analysts, because they were looking at financial factors, they ignored this. Now, in terms of the discount rate, so one argument that people make is that responsible business is about risk management, reducing systematic risk. And in the, the there is at least one academic paper in management science which, which suggests that. But actually, I, I think what I've tried to highlight in this talk is how responsibility is not just about risk management. Yeah, that's part of it. But really, mainly, I think responsibility is about actively doing good. And this goes to Thomas' question, which he's put on the Q&A, which is a great question. So for those who can't see it, he asks, what could we expect from businesses in the light of COVID-19? What is the role of business in this crisis? And I think that's really interesting because if we compare this to the financial crisis, in the financial crisis, business was the enemy. In particular, financial institutions, they were the ones that were, were, were doing badly. Now I see it's business which is often the saviour. Now, I think what we've really looked at, which has been the great thing, is that responsibility in this crisis has been about pie growing, not about pie splitting. What do I mean by this? Historically, we see responsibility as being throwing money at a problem. So giving a massive donation or giving a huge wage increase to your workers. But companies really can't do that right now just because they don't have money. So instead, what has responsibility involved? It's involved excellence and innovation and creatively thinking about what can I actively do good here? So some of the examples like LVMH, for example, they're now changing from making perfumes to sanitizer. Well, that's something if they hadn't done it, there would have been no media backlash. There would have been no outrage. But it's something where they're thinking proactively, how can we use our expertise? Another thing is Mercedes, which makes sort of pistons and um, for Formula One, right? How can Formula One help us in the crisis? But their huge expertise is precision engineering. And so they've used that to make some um, breathing machines because there you also need to be extremely precise. So I think the role of business in this crisis, yes, part of it is indeed, if you can split the pie differently, do so. So there's some companies where the CEO is taking no wages and there's some companies who are keeping to paying their workers even if they're furloughed. But I think we need to move beyond that because not every company can do that. But if you're instead of a company, you think about, well, what can I actively do good here to be proactive? I think that is what we should think responsibility is about. And if indeed there's a silver lining from the crisis, it'd be even when the crisis goes away, we should permanently think about responsibility as actively doing good rather than just doing no harm. So I see Diana's got a question. How can I think about growing the pie uh, in my day-to-day -day job? And uh, this is great because like I've talked about some examples of like real leaders of companies who decide I'm going to move from sanitize from 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 um 
from a perfume to sanitize. You might think, well, when I leave here, I'm going to be an associate at a, at a company or vice president of a company. Can I really cho choose things? And I think you, you can. So I think any person, what responsibility is about is asking yourself, what is in my hand? So what resources do I have? either within myself or does my team have and how can we use this to serve society so how did the idea of this ventilator come out from the first place well there was one person who found an old ventilator in his drawer and then picked it up and thought could we think about reverse engineering this and making this ventilator so it wasn't something that the ceo chose but it was that people actually try to do so let me think about one of my own examples i used to work for morgan stanley in investment banking. I was the lowest rung on the ladder, which was the analyst. And it's really tempting to think, as an analyst, I can't do anything. Nobody works for me. But actually, people did work for me, right? So some of you who've worked in banking world before will know that there's a department called the graphics department or the creative services department, which works for you. So you can give them a PowerPoint presentation and some markups, and you can ask them to do some changes. And they are the most abused people within investment banks. Why? Because if they make a mistake, then the analysts will start shouting at them. So what I did was that, well, if somebody did a good job, I would call up the graphics department and I say, hi, this is Alex. Somebody just did a job for me. Can you tell me their name? They said, yes, this was Juliet. And I said, well, can you put me through to Juliet? And they did. And I would say, well, hi, Juliet. Um, this is Alex. You just did a job for me. You did a really good job. These are all the things that you did which were really good. And I didn't do this ostentatiously. But the fact was, because I was so junior, I didn't have my own office. Well, I was in the open plan floor. And then the other analysts around me heard me do that. And then they started to do it themselves. So my answer to, to Diana's question is that even if you're a very junior person within an organization, but well, you can still have a huge amount of impact because you sort of change the atmosphere and you change how other people think. So this might sound a corny phrase, but I like it. It's be the thermostat, not the thermometer. Like the thermos thermometer reflects the temperature, the thermostat affects it. And what you've seen here, like even within the coronavirus pandemic, is the actions of just a few people can change things, right? So somebody, if you know that some of your friends are doing grocery shopping for their neighbours, then a lot of other people will start to do that themselves. So that's the idea that I, I, I want to um, start thinking about. Okay, should I um, go so, to... So, Alex, Sorry, go there's, there's a question I see. Uh, so, uh, Gaspar is asking, yep. how does your methodology fit into lowest skill or low worker impact industries? So, that's the last question. So, uh, the, is thinking about the industries where happy or more efficient workers are not always more profitable. Example, Amazon's warehouses. So, what do you think of that? That these people are not so skilled or he believes that, you know, their happiness is not going to turn into profit for the company necessarily. Should the company cares about them or not? Yeah, so this is a great question, Gaspar. So, so we're here with um, with something like uh, um, Amazon. So when I when I ch did my study on employee satisfaction, before I looked at the data, I thought that I would find it matters only in industries like health healthcare or software. So where you have a lot of high skill workers, and I thought you wouldn't get it in these other companies. Now, the first company to call me and want to discuss my research was McDonald's. Well, and that was really surprising because I thought if there was any a company which didn't need to care about its workers because they're more casual, it would be McDonald's. But they said, no, we actually think about this because with McDonald's, there are people who are going to be on the front line. And so they're going to affect how customers see us. And so similarly with, with an Amazon, you might think, well, that's even worse than McDonald's because they're not even on the front line. So what I'd say here is that with Amazon, it is indeed tricky. We invest in Amazon at Royal London Asset Management, but we are concerned about the worker behavior. So for us, we, because we think it's outweighed by all the good things they're doing to customers, but we are concerned about what they're doing with workers. But I think they're at least moving slightly positively in that direction. For example, giving the workers a pay rise within, um, I think it was $2 per hour within, within COVID. And also, um, I think the idea of happiness is interesting because 
often people think, well, we want to delegate and empower workers by giving them a lot of freedom. So people talk about the Google 20% time where they spend one day a week doing whatever they do want to do. But I think that's a, a little bit misleading because that's a bit one size fits all. So the correct corporate culture is depends on the organization. For example, in the military, there's strong rules there. You don't want people doing what they want to do, but that's fine because of the actual environment. And similarly with, with something like Amazon uh, or Walmart. So Walmart, I know they, uh, they, uh, they have efficiency and processes. And that to some people is good because it provides direction. Now, I am concerned about some of the, uh, of the practices within the warehouses, but the fact that it emphasizes efficiency rather than creativity is not necessarily a bad thing given the organization that they're at, they're at. So that's why I think, again, we need to think about things such as strategic context. Also, what I recognize is that, yes, there was a, I was supposed to end at 3.30 UK time, but I'm happy to carry on um, for, for, for however long it takes, because I see there's a lot of great questions here. So I know that maybe people have to go, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for these questions. So I'm happy to stay um, and I'll keep answering the questions. So It's great. Uh, great. Thank you, Alex. So as so I see another question that relates to maybe what you were talking, that Manu is asking, uh, what is the role of government here? So is it just that we try to manage uh, to, to educate managers and investors, or should the government somehow intervene and, you know, set up the rules and so on for the, for the companies uh, to, to follow sustainability and so on? Great. I do think there's a very strong role for government. So while I have, you're, you're correct, Manu, and I, I've emphasized that it's, it's companies that should want to do this. And why? Because you can't really legislate responsibility, but you can legislate, I'm not going to, don't mistreat your workers, but you can't legislate, innovate in order to think about making sanitizer rather than perfumes. But I do think I have got an entire chapter, chapter 10 of the book, is in the role of government. And I think there's many roles, but I'm interested in, of time, I'm going to just emphasize a few. One of them is externality. So what an externality is, is the effect that you have on wider society that doesn't affect the firm, even in the very long run. So what I've emphasized in the talk is that many things that you do to help society do help you in the long term, such as treating employees well, but there's certain things where they don't even affect you in the long term. So maybe carbon footprint, right? So you might pollute far more than it affects you in the long term. So the goal of the government here is to prevent these externalities either by ruling out certain behavior, like you can't dump waste or something, or by taxing them, such as a carbon tax. And so the role, if, if there is indeed to force companies to internalize the externalities. A second role is the role of redistribution. So I talked about the importance of growing the pie, creating social value, but also the division of the pie is important. And that's something the government can do through taxation of, of wealthy people and also spending to help those who are displaced, for example, through technology and automation final thing is competition. So one of the big forces, which I think is for responsibility, is the idea of competition, is that there's a company which is irresponsible, then customers can walk away from it and employees can walk away. But that's not going to be the case if there's no competitors. So I think one of the key roles is to make sure that there is competition that a government can play. Thanks. It was a really good question. Thank you. Uh, so, so Alex, I see also the last question now Gautier is asking. Uh, whether so you talked about good and bads so what if you know like does it mean that google for example can use our data you know issues about data privacy also is important in this context right and then says that i'm using it to, uh, to avoid terrorism or something like that so maybe they are doing more good for the society than bad but it's uh, it's the issues with uh, data privacy so how do you think of those this is a great question, Gautier. So what I'm putting in, in the chat is that the, this, um, you might have read the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And he says you can always rationalize a decision, but rationalize also means rational lies, right? You can always justify a decision after the fact. And as you say, Gautier, you can always come up with some excuse after the fact to say, to justify a, a, a even sort of a bad, um, a, 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 an immoral decision. So this is why I think a diversity of opinion is useful. So going back to Royal London, right? So there's the investment team and that investment team will come up with um, th who they want to invest in. 
But then they have the external committee that I serve on, which is an independent check. And why is that useful? Because the investment team, when they choose what to invest in, that will be partly on financial considerations. And it might be that an investment is a great financial opportunity and they can reverse engineer a moral story as to why this company is responsible. But that's why they have us as the external committee. And our remit is we do not analyze any financials. We purely look at the moral side of it to try to avoid that. Now, it's not perfect. And the question that Gauthier asks is, uh, is a subjective question. So there's no clear right or wrong. But I think having this external oversight or diversity of thought, that is a way of trying to make sure that um, we, we have this check so that you don't have the problem of rationalizing. Thank you. So, Alex, there's a question from Juliet. He was saying she was saying that uh, what are the steps for a company to implement uh, sustainable uh, responsibility in its business? So, as uh, you know, a company wants to become socially responsible. What should how should be the thinking behind this? Stuff? So, I think the first thing is to, to define for yourself what your purpose is, and purpose needs to be focused and targeted. What are the specific ways and think in which you want to serve society? So for myself, actually, as a professor, I have my own purpose statement, which is to use rigorous research to influence the practice of business. And that is targeted. It's purely focused on influencing the practice of business. So what that means is I love doing things like this, right? Speaking to you, which is the future leaders of this world, even if it means I can write one fewer paper or give one fewer academic talk, because my purpose is defined as that, that provides me direction. If I said my purpose is to use research to speak to academics and practitioners and PhD students and undergrads and uh, policymakers, then that wouldn't provide us clear direct direction. So that's one. Then I'd say define what measures you're going to look at to try to track how you are actually putting purpose into practice. And these are measures beyond the financial measures. And then third, to commit to report this externally to your investors and stakeholders. Why? because it then means that you will be evaluated not just according to your financial performance but according to whether you do well on those external measures so number one define it number two embed it by thinking of measures to track your, your progress and number three communicate that externally so that you're going to be held accountable thank you so much so alex uh, let's take the last question and then uh, we we maybe stop so the the very last question is asking what advice do you have for young professional who has passion to create value for society is it better to go from a traditional entry like investment banking or esg or responsibility investment directly so do you think uh, so do you have any advice for for them now they are looking for for some jobs uh, and they want to be socially responsible does it mean that they should not to go to investment banking or you know do, what do you suggest yeah thank you very much for asking this so i actually a lot of other things i speak about are things like careers and and, and purpose and so forth um and um i um there's an organization called gresham college in the uk where you give free talks lectures to the public just like michael faraday gave about science and my actual lecture series last year was on topics such as finding purpose in your career. So what I'm going to put here is a link to those talks, including the um, Cliff's notes, the, the short notes version. But I think the, 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 the main answer to that question is you think about your first job after leading EDEC as being a second degree, but one that you get paid for doing rather than actually doing. So where are you going to learn from the most? And so this is why for me, like even though I'm not an investment banker now, I'm really grateful for my two years in investment banking because I learned a huge amount from Morgan Stanley. So I think even being in the traditional investment banking, you're going to learn a ton about business. And I think the, the big problem with a lot of people who like responsibility is they see that business is evil. Right? A lot of books written about responsibility will say, oh, like CEOs are overpaid, companies are evil, and then they're just not talking, they're not engaging with the commercial side. So I think to understand how the commercial side operates is a really good um, sort of stepping stone in order to then go into ESG. Now, if you find a great ESG job right after, um, edX, then, then great. But I, I think that you don't need to think of, you don't need to worry that if you're going to go into a traditional job, if it's the job that you can learn from a lot, then it's a job that um, can, you can still learn, learn a huge amount from. So one of the biggest pieces of advice that I was ever given was you can do everything you want to and be everything you want to be, but not all at once. 
So what that means is we live very long lives now, right? So it, 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 we're going to have long careers. And if you want to do responsibility, it doesn't mean that you do, do it immediately from day one when you leave EDEC. It could be that you spend a couple of years learning the commercial, the nasty, difficult side of business, and then you make the pivot later, uh, just like I started doing Morgan Stanley, then academic research. Now I do more practitioner stuff with things such as the book and the policy enrollment. But I'll just say, well, thank you so much to everybody with their questions. Now, I know there's a lot of questions that I haven't yet answered. If you want to get in touch with me by LinkedIn, if you drop a message uh, through that, I will commit to answering every question that people give me. I'll just answer because there's one question that was asked twice. Um, so Marine, I think, was particularly interested in this, which is the Black Lives Matter movement. So she asked, do you think if a company does not communicate on its position, it can be assumed to be socially irresponsible? And I would actually say no. And why I wanted to answer this question, why it struck me is that there's a lot of companies where they saw Black Lives Matter and they decided, oh, let's post a black square or come up with some statement or let me donate a million euros to Black Lives Matter. Now, clearly, I'm someone who cares a lot about racial diversity. I'm someone who is personally affected by this. But I think with something like that, it's just too easy to make a quick superficial statement like posting a black square or making a statement. It's much harder for a company to actually put this into practice by saying we're going to be committed to having some bias-free evaluation and hiring processes and trying to put this into practice. So I think some of the most responsible companies are often ones that go about it quietly, thinking, oh, maybe we're not going to use the most eye-catching action. And sometimes, like, if, if you donated to charity and you did that, it wouldn't be a bad thing. But sometimes people think, oh, if I donate to charity, then that will absolve me from having to actually implement this into practice, just like people People signed the business roundtable statement last year and they didn't actually do anything about it. So I would say I would generally would think about well, the more internal, the more hidden ways in which you can actually put this into practice rather than just making a public statement. Okay, thank you very much, Alex, uh, for giving us this opportunity to listen to you. I personally enjoyed so much, uh, as always, uh, and I've been posting uh, some of your talks about uh, mental and physical uh, well-being and health and those kind of things for students already. And I uh, recommend everybody to go through uh, the, the Alex uh, presentation. It's all uh, uh, amazing and uh, we will be learning more and more from you and thanks again for for giving us this opportunity and have a great day everybody you're, you're very welcome and i say that it's not just a perfunctory off i, I if, 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 if you if i'm sorry that I, i'm so glad that there's loads of so much questions and interest but please do feel free yes. to follow up just drop me a linkedin message i'll be really happy to get back to you thank you so much for the opportunity and uh, and uh, take care everybody thank you so much for your interest thank you thank you very much alex bye bye, -bye.